Thank you all for coming. Uh, like Matt said, I'm Elizabeth Pocock. I'm one of the cardiac surgeons here. And so what I wanted to talk to you all about is something called surgery for a broken heart. But in all honesty, that's a little bit of a lie because really what we're going to be talking about is a history of mechanical circulatory support. And I didn't think that would get quite the same draw. So I tried to come up with something a little more interesting to get you all out of bed today. So that's overall sort of the concept that we're going to go with is surgery for a broken heart. So disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. And so surgery for a broken heart, because I think it's important for you guys to have some understanding since we're now doing the ventricular assist program here, and I'm sure you're seeing these devices go around. So when I spoke to you all previously, we talked about ECMO and all these sort of temporary devices. And so now you're seeing even more crazier devices. So this I thought would be helpful for you so you understand what the procedures are that are being done by cardiac surgery and really how it's going to affect you, whether general surgery, vascular surgery, whatever your role is in the hospital, whether you just hear crazy alarms going off so that they're a little bit less intimidating you have some idea what we're, what we're doing on our side. So surgery for a broken heart. So broken heart for the purpose of this talk means a medically refractory heart failure. So I think for me, if I were looking at it as a non-heart surgeon, I would say it wouldn't entirely be clear to me who gets heart surgery for heart failure. You know, because you've got tons of people who have heart failure. Some people get transplants, some people don't, some people get devices. And how do you sort of tease it all out? So that's what I'm hoping this is going to be the takeaway points for you guys. So a basic understanding of a definition of heart failure, what the basic medical management options are, although I don't really want to spend a lot of time focusing on that, and then the surgery that is done when medical management has failed. And that is really the role of surgery and heart failure. It is at once the limits of optimal medical management have been reached, that is when you do surgery for heart failure. Okay. So heart failure, uh, it's the it's same as any other organ that's failing. So it's the impaired ability of the heart to meet end organ perfusion requirements. So you have impaired perfusion of the kidneys, the liver, all kinds of things. According to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, it affects 5.7 million people in the United States alone. Those figures have actually are in the process of being updated, and now most people think it's closer to 6.4 million people. So it's obviously a huge part of the population is affected by heart failure. There's approximately a half million new cases every year. So obviously, again, it's common. It's very common. And it's the leading cause of hospitalization in people over the age of 65. And you guys know, as you're taking care of people, people, the population is aging. So while this is a huge problem now, it is going to continue to become an ongoing issue. Why care? Who cares, right? So there's a half million people every year. That's fine. But what you can say is the mortality is actually really significant. So the five-year mortality for all comers diagnosed with heart failure is 50%. So obviously that's skewed towards the people who are the sicker end of that group. And even the one-year mortality for people with end-stage heart failure, that alone is 50%. So it's a very deadly disease. So ideally, you're going to try and target people before they even develop heart failure. But now you've got heart failure. So what are you going to do to fix it and make it better? So this, I'm sure you guys have seen this for all of your patients who are going for any type of surgery. If they have a heart, most people will give them a New York Heart Association classification. And so it's generally a, a scale from one through four. There are some that break it down a little bit more, but we're going to focus more with the basics. So class one heart failure, all it means is that someone told you of heart failure. It was picked up on an echocardiogram. Your ejection fraction isn't what it should be. They're going to figure out why, but you're not symptomatic from it. So that's class one. Class two, you're doing pretty well. You don't feel as well as you would otherwise. You have symptoms, but you're still out and you're doing the things that you want to do. So that's class two. Now class three, I'm sure you can see, like this is drastically different. Class three, you only feel okay if you are not moving. So that is not really much quality of life. So class three heart failure, if you try to do anything, you feel it. You feel short of breath, you feel exhausted, all these things. So class three is a big deal, big jump from class two to class three. And then class four, your symptom, you can't do anything. Even just sitting, like you guys are sitting here in these chairs, you feel terrible. 
You feel terrible. So class three and class four are very, very significant heart failure. And that is where most people are trying to look to see if you can make some improvement, both in the symptoms as well as in their overall survival. So heart failure, you can, you guys all know this, but you can have heart failure for a variety of reasons. I think most people think of ischemic, meaning you get blockage of the coronary artery disease, you get a heart attack, it kills part of the heart, the heart no longer works as well as it did. But there's a, truly, there's a tremendous number of other causes that can do it. So non-ischemic causes of cardiomyopathy or heart failure, you can have viral. So, you know, we've got people coming in now with influenza, and that can affect the heart, and that can cause a myocarditis. You can have peripartum or postpartum. We see that here several times a year, so it's not in and of itself uncommon. Hypertension, diabetes, in addition to causing ischemic cardiomyopathy, can also have damage to the heart muscle itself that is separate from the coronary artery disease. You can have valvular issues, congenital pathology, alcohol and other toxins can cause heart failure, heart dysfunction, and then idiopathic causes. Those I would say are just sort of an overview, not inclusive of everything. So what I would say is, so now you've got your patient, you've diagnosed them with heart failure. So you're like, okay, well now I'm gonna hope that they go to a cardiologist. And it depends really if they go to a regular cardiologist or an advanced heart failure cardiologist, depending on how comfortable the cardiologist is in taking care of these patients, and probably a component of how sick the patient is. So I think most people will focus somewhat their practice on these, the 2017 ACC AHA heart failure guidelines, and they're just going to use these to sort of guide their practice, obviously, along with the many years of training that they went through for this. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's actually there's a lot of important things in it, so we're going to spend a second just going over it. So what I'd say is you're going to start up here, where it says established establish diagnosis of HFREF. I don't know if any of you have seen this lingo coming up in your charts. Uh, it stands for heart failure reduced ejection fraction. If you want to really impress your cardiology colleagues, you can start talking about HEFPEF which is heart failure preserved ejection fraction. We are not talking about that. That's not the entity that we're discussing today. We're specifically talking about heart failure reduced ejection fraction. So what you do, you're going to come down here to this column. You're going to pick your classification of heart failure. You're going to treat them with the medications, which are most commonly ACE, ARB, beta blockade, and diuretic. And then you're going to sort of see where they settle out. So you're going to say, okay, they've, you know, they've come down here. They're one of these classes of, of heart failure. But then you've got a couple outliers. So you've got these folks here who've got some high potassium kidney function. You're like, okay, we can add something like a spironolactone. Sure. Okay. Then you've got these other folks here who this patient has a decreased ejection fraction of less than 35%. So this person is someone who could potentially benefit from having an AICD because this population is at risk for sudden cardiac death from arrhythmias and things like that. One other thing that you've got that you can still add prior to going all the way to this far column is if you've got this patient who has a prolonged QRS, this says QRS greater than 150 milliseconds. Some people say greater than 120. But if you have this, so if you have an EKG change showing that your conduction system is not normal, what you can do is look at doing cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is just you're saying the pacemaker function of the heart is not as good as it should be, and you're going to try and get it back in tune to what it should be by doing something like a biventricular pacing to make the heart squeeze more efficiently and more the way is a normal function for it. Okay, So you've got your medications, ACE, R, beta blockade, diuretic, spironolactone, you can do the AICD if they have a significantly depressed EF, and you can do the cardiac resynchronization therapy. So you've done all these, the patient's been compliant, you've done the best you can, everything's working, but the patient still has over here a stage three, four heart failure, which we already talked about. They're really, really debil This is a horrible quality of life where they get symptoms if they try and get up from a chair or they're symptomatic in a chair. Okay, no one wants to live that way. So your options there, and remember, this is a huge population that we're talking about. Half a million people a year are getting these diagnoses, not necessarily to this extent, but are going to be affected. So what you got all the way over here, palliation. 
And I think most people would agree that that's a reasonable option for some people, but we probably don't want that to be our go-to for the majority of the people who are coming with heart failure. I think a lot of us think that we can do better than that. And so then you come to transplant. So transplant's great, right? I mean, you guys do transplant here. We do kidney transplant. We're going to be doing liver. We do transplant. Transplant is wonderful. But as we're going to talk about, same as for every other organ, there's not enough hearts for people who need transplant. And not everyone is eligible for transplant of the spectrum of people who have heart failure. So sort of what's come down the pipeline for a variety of reasons is this little yellow box here, which is called LVAD. It's actually called a ton of different things. So it can be called LVAD for left ventricular assist device. It can be called MCS, mechanical circulatory support, a bunch of different names. It tends to focus on the left side. So that's why most commonly the programs are referred to as LVAD or things like that. But that is sort of the catch-all area for people you don't want to send to palliation and for the people who are not eligible for transplant either currently or ever. Okay. So as far as surgery for heart failure, and this sort of falls under the umbrella of mechanical circulatory support, meaning using devices to help the patient's heart, um, that it's temporary or permanent sort of durable devices. So the temporary devices I didn't want to spend a ton of time talking about because this is similar to what we talked about last time where we talked about how we're using ECMO and impellas and balloons and all these things. For us in the land of the heart, we tend to divide the heart into left and right side. And so we're going to talk a little bit at the end about the ProTech because that's a device that we use here and has a role after you've done an LVAD and now the patient's right heart isn't functioning as well. So as far as the permanent devices, it's just a bunch of different abbreviations. It's nothing t truly terribly fancy. LVAD meaning you're going to put the device on the left. RVAD meaning it's going on the right. BIVAD meaning you're going to try and support both sides. Um, there is an operation named the door operation where you sort of carve the heart apart, try and create more reasonable geometry for a heart that's not working well. I didn't want to focus on that today because I really wanted you guys to learn about this new stuff that we're doing here. Okay? And then obviously heart transplant works great. We don't do it here. Okay. As far as heart transplant, again, this is how mechanical circulatory support has really been developed because these are the absolute most recent numbers. So this is the numbers through December 31st, so until about two days ago. The number of um, heart transplants, isolated heart transplants, were around 3,000 for the year. That's obviously significantly less than the number of patients who have severe symptomatic heart failure. Um, so not only are the numbers not in line, but there's also a really significant wait time. So the wait time is because of things like organ availability, but also it's affected by blood type, antibodies, all these other things, even where you live compared to where the organs are available. Uh, especially for this population, not all, popu not all heart failure patients are eligible for transplant. As we already said, heart failure patients almost exclusively are over the age of 65. And once you start getting to 65, 70, you're no longer eligible for a heart transplant unless there's certain exceptions that are being made. Pa people who have severe pulmonary hypertension are really not candidates for tra heart transplant. They can be heart-lung transplant candidates, but I think the number on here is about 29 were done in the year. They're very, very uncommon. Uh, if you have irreversible end organ dysfunction, you have COPD, you have cirrhosis, all these things, you're not transplant eligible. If you have recent malignancy or an infection that's going on, you're not currently um, transplant eligible. So that's really how you end up saying, okay, how are we going to help these people who fall out of this category or who can't wait that long? And so this, it, I'm a little disappointed that those students are here because I think this is actually very cool from an educational standpoint, the things that can be accomplished when you're still in training. And so in 1953, cardiopulmonary bypass was used for the first time to start doing heart surgery. And so heart surgery exploded because now all of a sudden you have this way where you can sort of route the blood around the heart and you can do operations that you couldn't do before. You can do operations that you couldn't dream of before. So heart surgery sort of goes nuts at this point from 1950s for probably another 40 years. So what happened was you're going nuts doing all these heart surgeries and then not all the heart surgeries are going that well. And so then you have these patients who've developed something called post-cardiotomy 
cardiogenic shock, meaning they had heart surgery, it didn't go so well, so now they're in shock. And so at that point, your only option is 1953, is to just keep trying to support them with the cardiopulmonary bypass machine and see if somehow miraculously they get better. And so didn't work that well. Um, so there was this guy, Domingo Leota, who I like to point out was a fellow. So he was still in training when he came up with this really genius idea. And it's pure coincidence that he came from Baylor, where I also came from. Um, so he was a fellow there. He had actually come from Cleveland Clinic, and he came down to Baylor, and he was working with the guys in the lab, and he kept seeing, you know, in Texas Medical Center, it's a huge heart center. There's an insane number of hearts being done every day, and so he got a really good exposure to what all the things that were happening. And he said, there's got to be a better way to deal with it than just having people on the heart-lung machine. And so he actually came up with this device, with the, like working together with his lab in 1962. But still, this is a very long time. First heart surgery pump, 1953, took nine years until this prototype was even sort of coming to the public awareness. But he came up with this. So what it is, is it's silastic, reinforced with Dacron, He's got a one-way valve in here, and then he's got a pneumatic pump. And so what his idea was, the ventricle, the left ventricle is what's not working. So you skip it. You sew this onto the left atrium. You've got your one-way valve pushing the blood down to the aorta. And now you've got end organ perfusion. And it worked. So what I would say is they put this in... The first time they put it into an actual patient was in 1963. So even after he had this genius idea, came up with a prototype, presented it, still took a year to put it into a patient. And what I would say is it's really more of a proof of concept because what had happened was this is a patient who had had heart surgery coded post-op. And so they opened his chest, they put this device in, but unfortunately the patient already had a pretty significant brain injury. They kept him alive, and they were actually able to demonstrate that this worked. Cardiac function recovered, the pulmonary edema resolved. They were able to explant the device, but the patient never regained neurologic recovery, so they had to withdraw. But this cardiovascular fellow, same age as everyone here who's a trainee in the room, that's what they came up with, and it really took off this entire field of mechanical circulatory support because now people are truly going wild trying to figure out a million different ways that they can sort of run with this and keep developing things. So what I would say here is, I, this is another reason I think heart surgery is so fascinating because it was essentially a bloodbath. It was mayhem in the world of heart surgery when you started here in 1960. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard about it, but this is the first. So Leota put in his first device, and they don't give him they give him credit for really proof of concept. And then in 1966, who's DeBakey, who he was working with. So now three years later, it took three years until they were able to get this device in that actually allowed the patient to survive. Okay, so you can imagine they're working like crazy trying to get these things to work. So 1969 is an interesting piece of Texas medical history. Most people are familiar. It is alleged that when Dr. DeBakey was away, because Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeBakey all used to work together, it is alleged that when Dr. DeBakey was away, Dr. Cooley stole the prototype for the total artificial heart and implanted it into a dying patient as part of being the first person to have ever done a total artificial heart. So that results in about 50 years of animosity between those two. Um, which is hard because it's a small area right there in Texas. So you can see the next 40, 50 years, there's a tremendous amount of things going on. I'm going to skip through some of them, and I'm going to just bring you to this point. This is another thing that was just crazy in the land of heart surgery because two years before DeBakey theoretically stole the total artificial heart, this guy, Christian Bernard, is a South African heart surgeon. So there are people in the U.S. who have been working their entire careers. They've been doing research for 20 years, solely dedicated to, you know, understanding how to do a human heart transplant, animal models, bench work. They've been working like crazy. And they just want to do a heart transplant. So this guy, Christian Barnard, he's done his animal experiments, none of which have worked. I think he's done it for about two years. None of them worked. And then he had someone who came in in a car accident, and he said, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I, that's fine. I'm just going to do it. And he did it. 
and he did it and he was the first per he's the most despised person probably in the whole history of heart transplant because he did it counter to everything he'd ever accomplished but he did it his patient survived 18 years or excuse me 18 days with that transplant and then this really kicked off a whole nother explosion of heart transplant now people are putting in like baboon hearts and they're just going nuts um, so he really kicked off an explosion of transplant showing that it could be done even if the durability of it was very very short so the reason I bring all this up is to help sort of demonstrate that there are different indications for mechanical circulatory support so yes while he did get this in you you already know there's not enough hearts to go around so now if you have a functional device that can sort of bridge people over until they can get a heart transplant, that's what's known as bridge to transplant. Postcardiotomy is what we were talking about in the very beginning. People who have had heart surgery and their heart is stunned, their heart has temporarily died, we're still hoping it's coming back, and that's called bridge to recover. There's also something called bridge to decision or bridge to candidacy. So bridge to decision, you're not sure, you're hoping they may still come back. Bridge to candidacy, they have something that's keeping you from wanting to transplant them. They're overweight, they smoke, something, and you're hoping that it's going to continue to improve and you'll be able to transplant them. Um, so this is just sort of a, as they're all laid out. So bridge to transplant, it's you want them to get a transplant, but you think it's going to be too long. You think that there's something that's going to, you know, keep them from surviving long enough to get there. So a circulatory support is a great way to get them to survive, to get to the transplant. The candidacy we talked about, destination therapy is for folks who are older. They're not going to become a transplant patient unless someone makes an exception for them. Their comorbidities are such that they're living with significant debilitating heart failure, but their quality of life and survival can be improved if you give them a device. And then bridge to recovery, which is probably the most gratifying of all of them, it's these postpartum patients or um, viral myocarditis where their heart has taken a huge hit, heart doesn't work, you give it enough time, and then the heart comes back and you're able to explant the device and then they go back and live a normal, healthy, healthy life. So that's lovely, it doesn't happen all that often. This one I put up because I think it's also interesting when heart surgery was truly going crazy and people were doing all these things. This is an example of destination therapy, which is not the way that destination therapy is used for us. So this is Barney Clark um, and in 1982. So again, this is 30 years now after all these things have been sort of in the works. And uh, Dr. Cooley's device was 1969 when he put the total artificial heart in. So now someone is trying it for something equally crazy. So this patient has agreed to have his own heart cut out and have this total artificial heart put in as his end game. That's all he's getting. He's not getting a transplant. He's not getting anything. He's not transplant eligible. He just wants to do this for the sake of forwarding science, just to say, can it be done? And so he survived 112 days with this. Um, but what's interesting, and this is actually, this device is over at the Smithsonian if you ever wander over there, because I think there's a big ethical debate about, it says that he was questionable for a heart transplant. He didn't get a heart transplant, he got the artificial heart. He was never a transplant candidate. But is that really fair to put that into this person um, who has no end game? And the device at this point hadn't really worked very effectively. I, from reading about him, the post-op course was horrible, horrible. He was completely bedbound, delirious, strokes, renal failure. And so, you know, while he did it of his own volition, it helped forward science. I, I don't know if he would do it again if he had the choice. So how then have we come to the devices that you guys are going to see us putting in now? So the total artificial heart, it's this, mostly, it's this <coughs> giant thing over here. <coughs> Excuse me. That is the electronic basis of a total artificial heart. So before you saw this thing, right? So let me see this. So this is where it plugs into the atria here, and then it plugs into the pulmonary artery and into the aorta. Okay, it's just this weird little thing, but it is driven by this giant thing, and the patient is tethered to that 24 hours a day. It's called Big Blue. And so now what happened is it has been transitioned because that was obviously crazy. So you had to be only in hospital. It was only for bridge to transplant. You were tethered to that thing 24 hours a day. So then they're like, okay, we agree. That's crazy. So now they came up with this little driver here. 
The problem with this little driver, which is called the freedom driver, is it keeps turning off. So if it keeps turning off, and that is your only source controlling your heart, you don't survive. You have no other backup heart. And so that is a glitch in the system that they're working on, and they've troubleshot it, and they think they've got it fixed now. But that's why people are not wildly enthusiastic about total artificial heart, although VCU, which is to the south of us, has done, I think they're at 75, and they've done them well, and they've got a good program in place to do them, but most people have not really embraced it. They feel like they're a difficult to utilize technology. The one time I think they can be used is right here. Um, because your own heart has to be large enough to accommodate putting a ventricular assist device in. And some people, women or whatever, their chambers, their ventricles are too small. And so truly, if that's a situation, that is, and you have to have biventricular failure, that is someone that you could consider for doing a total artificial heart, although it's not a terribly popular option. So now the focus has really switched to single ventricle support, which is all this stuff over here. So what you see is you sort of look from left to right, top to bottom. It started out giant, and it's gotten progressively smaller. I didn't want to focus a lot on the technology, but it also has transitioned from the way the device functioned to now. So it used to be a pulsatile pneumatic. Now they're continuous, a variety of different things that we will spend a tiny bit of time talking about. So these are the trials. I would say if you want to... Um, look really smart talking to heart failure surgeons or cardiologists, you can memorize all these trials. We're going to talk about this one, the rematch trial, and then this one, the HeartMate trial. So the rematch trial, this came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001, and so this is again proof of concept. This pump is no longer in existence, and this is an old technology that that's not utilized anymore. But what they were saying is you have someone who is a destination therapy, is having a device in better for them than having medical management. And what they found is a 48% reduction in death with the device compared to medical management. So you're like, wow, that's amazing. The only caveat being your one year survival is still dismal. Okay, so you're talking about some, now you've got a 50% survival rate instead of a 25% survival rate. So yes, you have made improvement and you've shown proof of concept, your technology works and you've probably made the person feel a lot better and they've survived longer. But it, I, I think at this point everyone still felt like there's a lot more room to go on making people better. So this other um, one here, this is just this destination. HeartMate 2 is one of the um, devices that wasn't until recently one of the more common ones that's used. We are not using it here, but since there's so much data on it, I just wanted to talk about it. And so what it said is it essentially compared itself. So it compared the HeartMate 2, which is a newer version, which is a continuous flow pump to this one, which is the old pulsatile pump. And the survival was, so they're just comparing their own technology and they're saying our newer technology is better and we have less, we have better survival with less disabling strokes from this. Okay, so now, so you understand heart failure. You say, okay, I understand the trials. I believe the evidence. I think ventricular assist devices are helpful. You're like, okay, yeah, I'm ready. Let me put in a VAD. So, okay, so step one, you have to be at a VAD center. So not every hospital can put in a VAD. And so that's why I'm sure you guys saw we went through about a million steps and meetings when we wanted to put ours in. So there's a, actually a, a million requirements in order to put a VAD in. So you for sure have to have a surgeon who knows how to put in a device, although it's not terribly complicated in the spectrum of heart surgery. You have to have a heart failure cardiologist and you have to have a VAD coordinator. No exceptions. But then you have 10 million other people who have to be on board and willing to participate in the process because your entire OR has to understand this technology. Your entire ICU has to understand the different physiology, how to take care of them after. ER, because you're going to have people walking in with crazy electronics you know, attached to their person that are going to be alarming all over the place. GI, because we get GI bleeds, neurology for stroke regular cardiology, infectious disease because they can get infections, nephrology, kidney affected, pulmonary, palliative care because these are people who are really, we talked, it's a pretty thin line between going to palliation and going to heart surgery or transplant. The rehab folks have to be able to get them up. 
case management and social work fin financial coordinator. These devices are not cheap. They are not cheap. And so you have to be able to take care of it and take care of it properly. Otherwise, it's not worth putting it in. Dietitian help them with nutrition and administration because someone has to pay for these devices. Okay. So then you've got all that part in place. And so now you're going to present your patient to the VAD selection committee. And again, that's all of us. As many people who can be there are there. It's the same as any other transplant um, group. So you discuss the patient, you make sure they understand their health literacy, you screen for depression, you make sure they have a certain baseline cognitive function, their CMS criteria they have to meet in order to be eligible for a VAD. We review all of their imaging and their labs. And you can see there's quite a bit that they're required to have. So then you may wonder, because one of the things is to be a bridge to transplant. So you either have to be at a transplant center or be affiliated with a transplant center. So we do not do transplant here. Y'all do. We don't do heart transplant here. Um, so what that means is we've collaborated with partners in the community. So we have collaborated with Fairfax, we've collaborated with the University of Maryland. And so when we are going to present a patient as a bridge to transplant, we p present the patient to them as well to say, are you willing to list our patient for transplant? And that has to happen if the patient is a bridge to transplant. Okay? and then you're going to put in the VAD. So someone has to have hopefully paid for this equipment for you, which again is quite expensive, and now you need to find space to keep your equipment because you know there's nowhere to put anything here. Okay. So the devices, let me see, I think my thing will work. So this is the HeartMate 2, and so what you can see is it plugs in here into the left ventricle, the blood comes through, comes around, and then it's connected up to the aorta. This is what's called the drive line. It's like the power cable. It's truly an electrical cord coming out of your person. Okay? We try not to, patients don't like to be told they have an electrical cord coming out of their person. So we just call it a drive line. And then they're connected to their controller. And then they've got battery packs. Okay? So that's can, they can be out and walking around. And then these are their system controllers. And sort of the same thing here for the hardware, which is over there. These used to be the two most common. But I'm going to show you it's changed a little bit. Okay, so this, I'm just going to point it out that there may be some similarities here. So this is the HeartMate 2, which they wanted to redesign. When they redesigned it, they redesigned it to look like this, which I think if you squint, there's a striking similarity between these two devices compared to what they started with. Okay, so what I would tell you is here we use HeartMate 3 and we use hardware. This device has been shown to be somewhat obsolete for a few reasons that I'm going to tell you in a little bit. Okay, So HeartMate 2 morphed to HeartMate 3. We have HeartMate 3 and hardware. People still use HeartMate 2 because HeartMate 3 is more expensive and if your hospital paid for HeartMate 2, most hospitals are making you stick with HeartMate 2. Okay, There's also some other things where they didn't all used to be approved for both bridge to transplant and destination. Now they essentially are. Now it's a wash. So now you can't say, I can't use hardware because it's not destination. They can all be used for the same purpose. So it's really dealer's choice if your hospital buys them and what you think for the data. So this is just um, specifically HeartMate versus HeartMate. So they did this Momentum 3 trial, which came out in March. And what it shows, so this is how the heart mate, the one with the sort of the bridge across the bottom, the blood is coming in and going here through this like propeller thing. This one, it's magnetically levitated, so there's no like friction is the goal. And it's just, just trying to propel the blood that way. So what they found is when they morphed from their heart mate 2 to heart mate 3, did their own sort of in company comparison, that the survival free rate of disabling stroke or reoperation was better. Okay? So that's why people are now trying to get the HeartMate 3 if their hospital only has the HeartMate 2. Okay? Um, and so, yeah. These are the indications that most hospitals would use. Um, roughly along these lines for putting in durable mechanical circulatory support. So you have to meet all these criteria. So you have to have failed medical management, you have to have the symptomatic heart failure, multiple hospitalizations, inotrope dependence, low, oxi low peak oxygen con consumption, and organ dysfunction. These are roughly what we're looking for. Um, the absolute contraindications are what we talked about 
end organ dysfunction that can't be salvaged. Medical non-adherence is huge because you're asking someone to be responsible for this device and take care of it. Uh, severe psychosocial limitations, if they don't have family or anyone to help them take care of it, they're not going to be able to. Age, obesity, relative. We did someone who's 164 kilos and he's doing fine, no issues. Um, a few other things here. So it's surprising, lack of social support, unmanaged psychiatric disorder, impaired cognitive function. It really affects their ability to take care of this device as far as changing out the batteries and they have to have a certain um, hand-eye coordination. So it's, there is a, a burden on them as far as being able to take care of it. This is just something I just wanted you to have in there just so you've heard of it. It's called the Intermax scale. It is a scale to say like when the patient should most benefit from a device. So if you have someone who is in critical cardiogenic shock, please don't put a VAD in that person. Um, their chance of surviving is very, very low and you're not going to help them. So you need to either give up or try and get them to a more stable point by whatever means you think is appropriate. And so really um, levels two, three, and four are the ones that you're going to look to try and optimize them and get them in the VAD um, sooner rather than later before they develop progressive end organ dysfunction that you can't fix. Okay, so this is a video. I thought you guys, since there's no requirement to see cardiac surgery anymore, I thought you guys would maybe find this interesting. It's a little bit longer than I would like, but hopefully it'll work and play for you. We played with it before you all got here and it was working. All right, we may have to skip it. We can come back to it, but essentially it just shows you how we do it. Um, truly, it's not the hardest operation that we do, although there's a few pitfalls. You have to, we do it through a sternotomy. You can do it through a thoracotomy. There's some minimally invasive ways to do it. We don't, we haven't got fancy here, although it's possible. You put the person on cardiopulmonary bypass, you actually do it with the heart beating so you don't stop the heart at all. You just try and position the heart up so that the apex is sitting there. You take their coring device and you core a giant hole in the ventricle so now there's like blood rocketing around the room. You just try and put suction in and just try and go on about your day. You sew this sewing ring, which is this part here. This is the sewing ring that's been sewn onto the heart. And so then what you do is you take your device, depending on which device you use, you take your device and it just sort of snugs in there and then there's a clip or a, a screw-on mechanism that puts it there. And then all you do is you just sort of bring it around at a natural curve, sew your graft on onto the ascending aorta. There's a few other maneuvers that you have to do in order to de-air because you don't want to send a bunch of um, air up to the brain. Um, but that's pretty much it. The key problem is what's called the inflow component. I'm going to show you on the next one if we can get to that one. Let's see if this one works. Try to your mouse to that screen. This one's working. Okay. So this, this is not the one I wanted because this is one of the vendor ones, but this is the inflow component here that's going into the ventricle. And so ideally, you really need that facing angled specifically towards the mitral valve. Because if you have it angled all wonky, it's going to go into the suck septum and suck the directly onto the septum instead of sucking the blood out that's coming through the mitral valve. And so there's a few key things, a few key ways you can really screw it up. So that's their coring device. The sewing ring is on there. There's the thing, you just screw it on. You can twist it around. There's the graft that's going to get sewn onto the aorta. And that cable off the end, obviously, that's the drive line, the power cable that's going to give the, the device the function. <coughs> and so this is just going to show the positioning of how it should be seated within the left ventricle to give you optimal flow, because what you don't want See, if it's not angled properly, it's going to be angled into one wall or the other, and it's going to set off a tremendous number of alarms. It's going to cause hemolysis, suction events, all kinds of problems that are just going to make it so the patient isn't getting the benefit of the device that they need. That's pretty much what it looks like. And then here's the battery pack, the controller, all these other things. So they do have to walk around with a fair amount of equipment. 
I will tell you, and like when you say like smart people have to have this, like it's a well-known fact that Dick Cheney had one of these prior to his transplant. Like even Dick Cheney forgot his backup batteries, ended up in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming with no backup. And you're like, what are you thinking? Like, how is that possible? But it happens, even smart people. So um, post-op, so like I said, the heart surgery itself is not especially rigorous. They have to go to cardiac IC. They have to have a cardiac nurse after. Standard meds for us in the land of heart surgery. Um, they must come out with a PA catheter because of the impending potential right heart dysfunction. Doppler blood pressure, it freaks people out, but they may not have a pulse because one of the n concepts of the new design is it's not pulsatile. It has the ability to generate some pulsatility, but they, if you try and check them with a cuff, you aren't always going to get it. And if you try and feel a pulse, you're not going to get it. So it's also hard if they're out in the community and someone thinks they're coding, that they're not you can't check a pulse, a blood pressure, all these other things. So they have to know to call us right away for help. Because if they're walking and talking, they're probably fine. You just sort of have to calm people down. Um, you want to extubate them early. This is different. They get immediate anticoagulation um, because it's really important to keep pump thrombosis from, f from forming. They get early ambulation, so our PTOT folks are really good. They're used to working with them because they've already done it with all of our ECMO patients. And then the teaching. I think the teaching component is a lot. It's a lot for the patients to have to learn how to take care of their drive line, how to do dressing changes, how to shower with this device on. There's a shower bag, changing batteries. There's a million things that go along with it. So um, the complications that we worry about when we're doing this operation is obviously surgical site bleeding because we're putting them on full anticoagulation well before we would for any other open heart surgery patient. They can get an acquired von Willebrand deficiency as part of this where they no longer have functional platelet aggregation. GI bleed is, is common. I've seen numbers anywhere from 18 to 40 percent in VAD patients and they can develop AVMs within the um, bowel from lack of pulsatility and for this it's really key. It's why you have to have a really advanced endoscopist prior to um, putting these in, making sure you have that person available on your staff. You can have strokes as part of this. Right heart failure, and the only reason I, I emphasize the right heart failure is I think it's one of the cool things that we do. It's this over here is a giant device that goes through the right internal jugular vein. It's like the world's most massive swan. It's probably like the size of my pinky finger, and using fluoro, you just sort of thread it through the non-functioning right ventricle and out to the PA, and, and so what we use most commonly is called the ProTech. And it works well. A um, little nerve-wracking as you're trying to get it around the RV, but it's a great percutaneous device for these people who otherwise would have to have an open chest. Uh, hemolysis, pump thrombosis, and infection are the other things we worry about. So goals. I put this x-ray just so you see, like if you ever get a VAD patient, you're going to see this device. They, and frequently they have the AICD. So that's just the normal pump. I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to look if it's malpositioned or not. And so for us, ideally, you want the patient to, get to go home two weeks after their operation with our anticoagulation and goal. They have to have mastered all of their teaching, and ideally they're feeling better with an improved survival rate. This is just one of the vendors. Um, this is from, because there's so much on HeartMate, too, just talking about how many pumps have been put in. And this, these, they have 10 patients, more than 10 patients right now. Sorry, 94 patients who've been living for more than 10 years with these devices. So they are somewhat durable. So they do give you some improved quality of life considering the patients that they were going in. And I know Heartware definitely has someone living 10 years, but I don't think they have quite this number. And this is a future. This I saw when I was in Germany. It's this little tiny thing called an MVAD um, made by the manufacturers of Heartware. And that's what they're, it's tiny. It's tiny. That's what they're trying to work on for their next project. That's it. Thank you. Elizabeth. Yeah. It was really nice Good. to see and we hear more and more about heart failure and, and also you start the LVAD program here uh, with cardiology. So um, uh, we hear about it more and more. So it's nice to have the whole thing presented in one talk. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, Incidence of heart failure increasing, or we're diagnosing that disease more. Because <coughs> you say you got five million people uh -huh. heart failure of three hundred forty million in the United States. That's one and a half percent. Yeah, it's very common. So, stage one, uh, you said no symptoms, normal living. Mm -hmm. So, is 
stage one heart failure or basically normal heart? It's heart failure based on echo. Uh, my interpretation would be it's heart failure based on echo findings. So. So are these included within the five million? Yes. Yes. Okay. So there, there, there are in this five million. Uh, it's not. Patients that actually are completely asymptomatic. That's right. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, specifically uh, warfarin or Coumadin, and it's challenging because you know it can be really painful to try and manage Coumadin. That's what we've been doing on our most recent one for several weeks now, and so specifically so far, only Coumadin. But now that I think the reversal agents are starting to become available for the NOACs, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that people look at doing in the future as long as they can be reversed. Now there's one, and I think there's a second one that's now FDA approved, um, but it's always only been tested on Coumadin. So. Okay. Yeah, thanks.